times arrow. While investigating an archaeological discovery, data is transported into the past. The Enterprise has headed for Earth to participate in the examination of evidence of extraterrestrial activity on Earth in the late 1800s. Picard points out that there are better people to consult and asks why they were called to Earth, which you would think he would have asked before they actually got there. And he shows that he has no training on firearm safety by pointing that gun right at Data's face. Or maybe that was a subtle gesture that Patrick Stewart didn't want to yield any lines to Brent Spiner. <laughs> And it turns out one of the items they discovered was a data mannequin head. Revealed in a very dramatic fashion. And not with the other stuff for some reason. <laughs> data examines it, and Riker asks how he can do so without reacting emotionally. Maybe it's because he's a robot. Data also determines that it is his head and not Lore's, which I'm glad they addressed. And he concludes that his life will end in the late 1800s, even though he's a robot. Jordy says that all the evidence points to an alien race that they haven't encountered before, who may have been shapeshifters taking the form of humans. He finds a fossilized cell, and they head to the place of its origin. Jordy and Data talk in Ten Forward, where Jordy asks why he's not upset to know about his death. He tells him he needs to be upset about the situation, apparently also forgetting that his supposed best friend is a robot. Which I think says more about Jordy than anything. Data says he is comforted to know that he will not live forever, because knowing he will die makes him more like humans, even though robots can't die. Snooping Guinan overhears the conversation, that's her new name, <laughs> and uses subtle, and that's a quote, body language to show that she knows something, and is apparently very happy that Data will finally die. <laughs> Troy talks to Riker about how uncomfortable he is by the discovery of Data's head, and they note that many other people are upset by it as well. She says that they're all used to each other, which is why Riker feels angry. And I didn't know you needed a space psychology degree to figure that out. Good work, counselor. <laughs> they get in the turbo lift while Data is in it, and he comments on everyone else's discomfort around him. And Riker explains things in the way that Data does, and Data says that he is fond of them too. The Enterprise reaches the planet of the fossil's origin, where Data picks up a temporal disturbance. How do they sense something like that anyway? With the sensors. <laughs> And Data is surprised at not being chosen for the away team. When he asks Picard why, and says they can't cheat fate, Picard says they can still try. Haven't there been other time travel episodes in this show with these characters where they've altered the course of events via their actions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the away team checks out a cave, and although they can't see anything, Troy says she senses many terrified humans. And it also has the same residual evidence as the cave on Earth, showing they are somehow connected. Jordi and Data determine that they are occupying the same space as the aliens, but in a different time, making them out of phase. And he says he has a way to allow them to phase to match. How odd that he didn't have a way to adjust phase just a couple of episodes ago. The only way they can adjust the phase is by using an object that is part of Data's body. So he's the one that has to go, although he can still use audio communication. Somehow. He reports finding silver humanoids who are ingesting energy from a machine. Through their foreheads. <laughs> Just as he reports seeing the entities take a snake out of a force field, some kind of temporal distortion occurs and he is transported to late 1800 San Francisco. And because it's Star Trek, nobody seems to find him odd or out of place outside of a minor remark or two. He meets a bum who claims to be a former football player. Could you help out a 49er? He runs into an annoying bellhop, who mentions playing cards, to which Data figures he can get some money that way. And naturally he does well, but I would like to have been on set to see where those cards actually went after he threw them. And one of the poker players is played by Mark Limo, who we've seen on this show three or four times now, as the dog thing, as a Romulan, as a Cardassian, and now this guy. He has a lot of roles on this show. They're all connected! Boom. Got it. <laughs> the most unexpected. Okay. If I can do it, I'm going to do it. He gets a room in a hotel and tells the bellhop that he is an inventor and gives him a list of items he needs to buy. And that was when it was apparent that this annoying bellhop was going to become a recurring character in this episode, which was not great. <laughs> The former football player is approached by a couple who shoot him with an energy beam. 
Back on the Enterprise, they're having a meeting about the intention of the time-traveling aliens and if it's malicious. Picard says they need to move on from Data's disappearance, and Riker has a very out-of-character overreaction. I'm not willing to accept that he's dead and just leave it at that. We cannot make Mr. Data our priority. What is more important than Data? I was wondering if he had stored some proprietary information inside of Data, and he was just worried he was going to be lost. And he's like, ah, shit, people are going to figure out what I did. Maybe all of his hollow porn. <laughs> Jordy says he can build his own face adjuster to fit multiple people, but it will take time. And why he couldn't just do that earlier, I don't know. Yeah, did he not consider that until Picard suggested it? It doesn't seem to take him that long to actually do it. Picard goes to talk to Guinan, who is making an honestly idiotic sounding drink. It relies on people's body temperature being an exact degree, but people's body temperatures change all the time. She tells him he has to accompany the away team, but won't tell him why. And she says if he doesn't go on this mission, they'll never meet. Back in San Francisco, Data builds a weird sci-fi machine, and it reminded me of Spock building a weird sci-fi machine while he was in the past in the original series. The annoying bellhop asks what the invention is going to be, and suggests that he can sell it when it's done. And it was clear that this kid was going to be some historical figure, and I was just hoping it wouldn't be one that I liked. Then Data notices an article about a literary reception and sees Guinan's photo. He goes to the party, and we see Deep Throat, who we last saw on this show way back in Season 1, in When the Bow Breaks. And this time, he's playing Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. What really annoyed me was the other guests, in that they all murmur and titter whenever he says anything, even things that are not clever. Yeah, and they don't actually seem to be paying attention to him that much. But regardless, it is ancient in the extreme. <laughs> now, He's speculating about how old the cosmos are and the existence of life outside of Earth. Data arrives and pushes past the doorman to see Guinan. Who appears to not know him, but when he mentions the Enterprise being a starship, she quickly pulls him away. He explains things, but not everything, because why would he do that? And at one point she asks if her father sent him, which intrigued me, but then he cuts her off. And it turns out that Clemens has been eavesdropping the whole time, which is probably where snooping Guinan picked up that habit. <laughs> eavesdropping is by no means a proper activity for a gentleman. Nonetheless, the deed is done. We cut back to the future, where an away team is setting up Geordi's phase shifters. And Picard says he's going in lieu of Worf, who seems a little upset. Geordi phases them to where they can see the aliens who are sucking energy orbs out of some sort of container. Picard asks why the aliens can't see them, and Geordi says, Phase displacement might not bring us far enough into their perceptual range. What the f*** is he talking about? Are they in phase with them or not? <laughs> they can see them, but they can't be seen? That doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Just like that other episode. Troy senses echoes of the last moments of human life, saying they all died in terror. She says the orbs must have once been human. Two beings walk out of a time portal and deliver more energy orbs before heading back out. And one of them has a goofy looking space snake with him. And that was the best part of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully the portal stays open for a really long time, allowing all of the away team to follow. To be continued. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Time's arrow. Overall? We started out with an intriguing mystery and some decent character stuff with everyone dealing with the knowledge of Data's apparent destruction, although it was a bit over the top, especially freaking Riker. But then they quickly started bringing in made-up stuff, and when Data got transported into the past, we got the predictable dumb jokes I would have expected, and a lot of it felt like treading water. Nothing made much sense, and then we got a Mark Twain tangent that went on forever, then a space snake, and then it was over. I did like the way Guinan was used in this episode, and I'm semi-interested to see how that part of things plays out, although after everything else, I'm not expecting it to make any sense. For a season finale, this was incredibly disappointing, and when it comes to being a two-parter, I shouldn't be just wanting the next part to get over with so we can get onto something better. I gave it a C-. I gave it a C. Why was everyone so upset about Data dying in this particular case? What about the episode where the ship blew up like seven times and they all died? All they did for that was just have a meeting and say, hmm, we'll see what happens. They didn't even have that big of a reaction when Jordy and Rose supposedly died in the next phase. 
Yeah, they all played music and had a party. <laughs> <laughs> if Guinan knew what was going to happen and was apparently amused by it, why didn't she say anything less cryptic? Is there something preventing her from doing so? The answer is probably going to be the script. <laughs> Data's fake head looked pretty bad. Like a Halloween mask. Especially his eyes. I thought the guest characters, like the bellhop and Clemens, were way overplayed and goofy. We've had two-parters, even season finales, that were really good. This one did not meet my expectations. I thought the Inner Light would have been a much better season finale. But, as they say, the deed is done. <laughs> I do a pretty good fake-ass Mark Twain. 